everyone for coming today. My name is Lillian. I'm the Audience Engagement Officer here at Baptist Regional Art Gallery. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people as the traditional custodians of the land and waterways in the Baptist region and where we meet today. Um, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to any Indigenous community members we have with us in the audience today. So um, today is our second session of the Saturday talks that we have on during the Archie 100 exhibition. We've got authors, um, artists and the curator of the show coming up. But today with us we have author Peter Edward, who I will briefly introduce and then I'll hand over to Peter and then we'll take questions at the end. So Peter Edwell is the author of the fantastic book, The Case of Stop Donation, the Archibald Prize Controversy of 1944. Peter is a senior lecturer at Macquarie University in Sydney in history and archaeology. Um, and Peter owes his research um, as an ancient historian as invaluable tools to writing this book. Um, so I think, I believe Peter also has connections to Australian art, family connections to Australian art, which um, also piqued his interest on this topic, um, but I will hand over to Peter, so we're thrilled to have you here today, and please welcome Peter. Thanks so much, Lillian, and I have to say at the outset, I love this gallery. I've been here a couple of times in the past, and there's just something really terrific about it, and I think um, what the gallery has done with Archie 100 is brilliant, and it's just so good to see to see the Norris glory here, so we're very lucky to have this in Bathurst. And it's only really uh, going to you know, a handful of locations. It's already been to Geelong, it's already been to uh, Adelaide, Long System now here. Um, and uh, in fact, when it was first um, on display in Sydney, it was just as COVID shut everything down again uh, in 2021. So a lot of Sydney sites didn't get to see it. So as I understand it, Sydney sites are popping up here to have a look at it. Uh, and I believe it goes on to Darwin and then on to the Portland Gallery in Canberra. So it's just brilliant to see it here in Bathurst. Um, I do have a bit of a connection to, to Bathurst and I'll um, refer to that um, probably a little bit later on. And already I've had a wonderful conversation with somebody um, who knew, uh, who was family in Mary Edwards and what I've discovered as a result of doing these talks and doing a few interviews, of a couple of ABC interviews recently. Another one will be coming out later in the week on Rod Quinn's Overnight's program. Um, and I was talking to Rod to say that I did that interview with him about the number of interactions I have with people who have some sort of personal connection to stories around the Archibald, particularly to the, um, the controversy that we're going to be talking about today. So thank you so much. Uh, for, for turning out here on a Saturday morning. I know how precious Saturday mornings are. Um, it's nice and warm out there too. Isn't it? So hopefully though, you'll be pleased with the hour or so, 45 minutes you've set aside to come here to listen to what I've got to say. Um, the book, the title, The Case That Stopped the Nation, plays obviously on the race that stops the nation, although it's increasingly not stopping the nation anymore, is it? It's been Turn away, I think, in some senses, for legitimate reasons from things like the Melbourne Cup. But I wanted to get a sense of just how much this particular event, this particular controversy of 1944, drew people's attention. And that it was connected to the way that the Archibald, to a certain extent, stops the nation. It doesn't quite stop the nation. But we're all sort of looking out for it, a lot of us are looking out for that announcement. And there's a lot of, there's a, quite, quite a lead up, quite a build up to the announcement. And there's, discussion in the papers about it. And then there's usually controversy around it. You know, people either screw their noses up at the winning prize, the winning portrait, or they absolutely love it. Um, there are other um, prizes around it now too, of course, things like the Packing Room Prize um, and the People's Choice Awards, so that people have a bit more of a, um, a bit more of engagement um, and um, um, experience of it themselves, and sort of say, I suppose, in that they think about portraiture. As we look around the galleries here, one's paintings I can see immediately in front of me, with the W.B. McInnes's winning portrait, the very first one to win, um, awarded in 1922. I find this an extremely important portrait, not so much because of the style, but simply because it's the first winner. We've got a portrait um, by Florence Rodway of J.F. Archibald himself, just over there. Um, up from the 
hands portraits. Do make sure you have a look at that one. Florence Rodrigue is actually a very close friend of my great aunt, Bernice, as well, who was an artist, and I'll refer to her a little later. In here, in this room, we've got portraits directly related to this controversy. We have a portrait of Dame Mary Gilmore, the Joshua Smith painter, and has often been considered to be the runner up for the prize in 44. And we have William de Bell's uh, Billy Boy, which was one of the three final entries, of, or one of the Bell's three entries, or three made it into what we think of as the finals. Um, it didn't win, but it came quite close. And in fact, de Bell thought that that portrait might have a good chance um, of winning that particular uh, in, in 44 and very controversial year. Um, we then also have in the furthest gallery along up on the right, we have Brett Wigley's self portrait. Um, do make sure you have a look at that if you haven't seen it. And he's looking into a quite distorted mirror, and the reflection back is the portrait of Joshua Smith by William de Bell. So, and that one that the to all the nerds in the end. So, there are a number of portraits in this exhibition that's directly related to this, and um, you might find that there are a couple of others, I won't tell you about those just yet. Now, uh, in 1944, he awarded the Archibald Prize to William de Bell sparked a storm of controversy that's still remembered as one of the bitterest and most advised episodes in the history of Australian art and culture. And it spawned a court case that the whole country would eventually follow. And what was it about William de Bell's portrait of his friend and fellow artist, Joshua Smith, that sought both uproar and approval from the artistic community, drew strident commentary from politicians, business people, lawyers and judges, even the interests of soldiers in New Guinea at the time, and it eventually led to a theatrical four-day trial in the New South Wales Supreme Court involving some of Australia's most influential and prominent legal minds. All of this in the middle of World War II, which at times was knocked off the front pages of newspapers by news of this controversy, particularly around the Supreme Court case. Now, my book tries to answer this multifaceted question in the process of constructing the events from a number of different perspectives. And at one level, there was the public controversy and at another, there were private and behind the scenes connections and relationships that contributed importantly to the the controversy. The media, and really here we're talking about the newspapers, was another important factor in stoking and maintaining the dispute at the time, and some old grievances among newspaper parents contributed to this, something we're not necessarily unfamiliar with today. Now, putting the dispute into a broader context, the Archibald Prize had been the subject of controversy since first award in 1922 to W.B. McInnes. And five years before the 44 controversy in 1939, a similarly bitter dispute over the prize emerged when Nora Heysen became the first woman to win. On this occasion, a court challenge was only narrowly avoided, and the same person, Mary Edwards, was the person leading the challenges against the award of that prize. The Bell's portrait of Smith was also seen as an indication by some of the influences of modernism Although many, including Deville himself, denied that modernism was ever to be found in the portrait. And debates about the impact of modernism on Australian art have become increasingly bitter and intense uh, during the 1930s and 40s. And some of the ideological factors over which World War II was fought fed into some of these intense debates between artists and others over the impact of modernism. So the Archibald Prize controversy of 1944 was born into an intense world of public debate and argument with private relationships that were fraught and divided, and it would itself become part of intense debates and arguments at both public and private levels. And what I'd like to do now is to consider some of the key elements of the public funeral as 1941 followed, before looking at the court case briefly, and then a few important behind the scenes private um, developments. The book goes into these details and more in quite a lot more detail than I can cover today. But will at least get some sort of sense of that here. Now, within days of the announcement of the Warden Prize on the 21st of January 1944, um, De Bell, uh, William De Bell awarded the portrait, uh, awarded the prize for this portrait of Joshua Smith, formally titled Portrait of an Artist. Strong statements of criticism and praise appeared in the press, and in criticising the portrait, the president of the Royal Art Society accused De Bell of producing a caricature and claimed that quote here, caricature is the lowest form of graphic art, since it is based upon a lie, and all decent art is based upon the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
He also believed that Bell's portrait was an example of artistic Bolshevism. Strong words, and I thought of course, that. The Herald's art critic, Paul Hayflick, uh, himself um, classed himself as an artist, I don't know that I do, but um, he would kill me if he still alive as that. But anyway, he was an influential critic. He described the winning portrait as masterly and defended De Bell's approach to painting portraits that emphasised the character of the subject rather than just reproducing an accurate likeness. Um, like others, Hayflick pointed out that many past masters, such as Rembrandt, had initially faced a barrage of public criticism at the time their work started to become well known publicly. Now, we sort of get this idea here of the reproducing an accurate physical likeness. If you turn quickly to have a look at the McKenna's portrait, just behind most of you to the right, back to the right, this is the type of portrait that won year on year on year, from 1922, really up to this time. Um, and it's often sort of described as a like border art, you know, that it was meant to be sort of perhaps, if you like, and that these were the types of portraits that were winning. Hayflick would point to a portrait like this and say, well, look at it, it's so much more expressive, it's this character, it's so different to this type of thing. And, and that was greeted with, uh, um, um, quite um, positively by people like Hayflick, but rejected by others who saw it as a dangerous thing. Now, Joshua Smith himself commented, dear me, I hope I don't look like that, I don't think I do. Attending the gallery to view the exhibition of finals, Smith's concerned father was spotted staring at his son, then at the portrait and shaking his head. Um, that's probably what my father would do. Um, in another newspaper, newspapers published over the following days, photographs of Smith next to the portrait of Kim, which increased Smith's anxieties about it. And Smith's reaction to the growing controversy over the portrait would become centrally important as 1944 unfolded. Now it's important also to remember that Smith's own portrait of Dame Mary Gilmore was considered a runner up to De Bell's portrait of him. So we already have a complex situation, don't we? And that's the portrait in there that Joshua Smith painted of Dame Mary Gilmore on that wall um, there in a very prominent position. It's great to see that position. Now, among a considerable number of artists who like the portrait, one prominent Sydney artist, Mary Edwards, would emerge as the most scathing. And the figure would ultimately uh, drive the Supreme Court case. She would be the figure that would drive the Supreme Court case over the portrait later in that year. And this is where a family connection comes in. Mary was my great aunt. Um, she was the illegitimate, I really don't like this term, but that was, that was the term at the time, daughter of my great great grandfather. Uh, he had a daughter, Aunt Bernice, who was also an artist. They both trained at Paul Rossi's in Paris in the early 1900s. Mary, sometimes. The next actually. And this is what drew me into this controversy in the first place. I'm actually an ancient historian, I'm masquerading here very much as a modern historian. But as I got into this, I realised more and more what an incredible title this was and how important this was as an indication of what's going on in Australia in the Second World War from a cultural perspective, from a political perspective. And as I did more archival work, I realised that there was a cool book in this and that no one had really done that. Now, Mary Edwards had been an entrant in the Archibald Prize ever since it was first awarded in 1922, and Aunt Denise had also entered in that first year. So they were half sisters. Um, Mary had come close to winning the prize on a number of occasions, and was a prominent, if not controversial, figure in the art world of Sydney at the time. And in fact, she really had won the prize the year before this in 43. Um, I found letters between Lionel Lindsay and his brother, um, Lionel Lindsay writing to his brother with glee that he had succeeded in having the, having the Edwards portrait overturned in favour of a William Darby's portrait of Paul Jim Gordon. Um, now, in pressing views within days of the award of the prize to the bill, Edwards referred to the decision of the trustees of the gallery as the judges of the prize um, as an artistic pearl harbour. These, these are strong words around the book for, and called the portrait a grotesquery. And in one of the public meetings she organised to protest against the award, she urged on quote, that children and pregnant women should not be permitted to enter the gallery while the picture was hanging there. Applauded, <laughs> applauded her to a person at these meetings she made. Now, by the beginning of March, Edwards and another artist, Joseph Walensky, had decided on the unprecedented step of taking development and the gallery trustees to court in an attempt to overturn the award of the prize to poor old women development. Public interest was enormous from the outset. Nearly 11,000 visitors viewed the Archibald finalists in the week after the award was announced. 
And by the time the exhibition closed in March, would you believe it, nearly 153,000 people had attended. Now this compares went through the minute books of the gallery trustees, um, which was very exciting reading, I have to say. But in 1943, 13,300 people attended the exhibition. In 1944, 153,000. Around 60,000 attend today. Sydney's population in 1944 was around one and a half million, so it's one in 10. Today we're talking 450 to 500,000 people. That would be the equivalent. That's the level of public interest that this drew. Intense arguments between members of the public took place in front of me, and gallery staff became increasingly nervous as a result. And when Dame Mary Gilmore visited the gallery in the first week of the exhibition, the atmosphere was, according to her, and I'm quoting again, astonishingly alive. As to for and against, there were almost battles. One attendant told me fairly against the price around so high, he feared someone might even try to damage it. She visits the gallery again and says the same thing. People were virtually breaking out in fist fights um, in the gallery before this war. It's hard to believe, isn't it? that this is what's going on in the middle of the Second World War in Sydney. Now, William Deville was initially shocked, um, as, um, as you can um, imagine, initially very shocked um, at the reaction to the painting and the scathing nature of the criticism level there. And he chose to lay low in the days and really the hours of the announcement of the award. But within a fortnight, um, he began to find his voice. And in an interview with the Sun newspaper, he claimed that Joshua saw the progress uh, of the portrait all the time I was painting it. He gave me every facility and was in no way critical when he saw the finished work. The Bell was interviewed on radio and took the opportunity to respond to the growing, uh, growing storm of criticism over the award of the prize. And he believed it was the jolt of something new that the average critical member of the public objected to, and they hadn't bothered to investigate what it was that he was trying to do in painting the portrait. Now, in bringing the legal case, Mary Edwards claimed that the trustees of the gallery had not held to the terms of Archibald's will. And on his death in 1919, journalist, publisher, and founder of Fulton, John Felton Archibald, he liked to go by the name also Jules Francois, um, was a francophone. He left almost £9,000 in a trust from which to fund the prize that would take his name and, of course, become part of Australian folklore. When making his will in 1916, Archibald had stipulated that the prize should be awarded each year for the best portrait, preferentially, of some man or woman distinguished in art, letters, science or politics, painted by any artist resident in Australasia during the 12 months preceding the date um, that the trustees had assigned for sending him the pictures. According to the Royal Trustees of the Gallery, it would be the judges. Edwards and her followers claimed that the Bell's painting was a caricature and should not qualify as a portrait was caricature was satirical and was up to the newspaper company. So portraiture was a serious, serious thing, and caricature just didn't fall within the definition of portraiture, and that was the legal argument. Now, as the controversy grew, Mary was actually received support from a lot of different influential quarters. There were a lot of people defending the bill, but a lot of people supporting her. And Gladys Archibald, Archibald's niece, wrote to Mary, and Mary made sure that part of the letter were published in the papers. And Gladys has said to Mary, I understand my uncle gave the prize for the best portrait and also to encourage art. No one surely would call such a thing a portrait. I have not the public in shock, Sam. This is Archibald's niece. Now, in early February, the Daily Mirror published a letter written about the award of the prize to Deville by James MacDonald, who was the former director of the Art Gallery of New South Wales and the National Gallery of Victoria, and then art critic for the Melbourne Age. And it's still memorable for his scathing comments. MacDonald labelled the, the depiction of Smith as a circus freak exhibit and suggested that Smith appeared deformed and was suffering from malnutrition. These were the types of things, the insults that were hurled um, at this portrait. And as he accused the trustees of voting for this epitome of ugliness, malformation, and gruesome taste. And some 20 years after the events, DeBell would remember receiving hate mail. How much he's got the personal attacks leveled against him. Um, at one stage, he talks about he's walking down the street and the tram's coming past. And the, the tram stopped, and everybody stood up in the tram to look at him um, as, he's, as he's walking down the street. And DeBell was a very shy man, he just didn't sit well with him at all. Now, as I said before, the defence of DeBell gathered um, uh, pace with as much momentum as the attacks. And Russell Drysdale, writing the Tribune, was very strongly supportive of the award. 
of the prize, same news, it's been gratifying to see that an artist of such distinction and stature has developed a game prize um, with a portrait which is in every sense of art. And one of the most surprising figures in all of this is the main support to develop was Michael Lindsay. And Lindsay was one of the gallery trustees and had strongly argued for Debell's portrait to be declared the winner. But in recent years, he'd been one of the most prominent opponents of modernism and its influences on Australian art. And in 1942, he published a book with the title Added Art, which attacked modernism in the harshest terms and drew heavily on anti Semitic sentiment at the time. While some believe that the portrait was strongly influenced by modernism, one of modernism's strongest critics didn't think it was. Then inevitably, as the whole nation started to follow the dispute, we get the politicians. Um, they still do it in this controversy. State and federal politicians begin to run again. And the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Solomon Rosemary, his portrait on the right by Joshua Smith, who won the Archibald Prize for Book 4, that was a very controversial year, it won then, uh, was awarded the following year, declared that he was relieved William to would not be paying his official portrait for the parliamentary collection. I would feel like cutting his throat if he did to me what he did to his fellow artist, was what Rosemary said. And Smith, as I said, was the artist commissioned by the Parliament to paint the official portrait of Rosemary, and it won the following year. And of particular interest was com the comics made by Robert Menzies, then leader of the opposition, only days after those of Rosemary. And in Menzies' opinion, De Bell's painting of Smith was magnificent. I was not objecting unless it had been painted by it. You might not expect that. Damien Lyons, whose official portrait was to be painted by Mary Edwards, commented on the developed portrait in her first public speech as a newly elected parliamentarian. She was generally critical of it, claiming that Debell had run the track. While Billy Hughes publicly defended Mary Edwards quite, um, quite um, um, significant, actually, and roundly condemned Debell's approach to art generally. Now, the dispute became the subject of a whole range of public discussions and quite a lot of fun was had with it. It became the subject of some skits at the Tivoli Theatre, we're told, and um, we even have these um, caricatures, caricatures very much um, on display through this whole period, these caricatures of um, Hitler in similar guise. And pretty provocative stuff, wasn't it? For, the 1944. And with the a court case now imminent in September, the Royal Art Society um, was about to have its annual spring exhibition, its big exhibition, and had huge attendances at this spring exhibition. Thousands of people went to it. And this spoof portrait of Hitler um, with the title Nemesis was the one that stole the show. This was the one that everybody turned up to see. And you know, Nemesis, the artist who painted Nemesis, has never been identified. And if you look at the background for that portrait, I'm pretty sure it's Mary Edwards. That's a very, this is the only image we have, but it's a grainy black and white photograph from the papers at the time. But I suspect Mary painted it. Now, after nine long months, um, after the decision, the court case began on the 23rd of October. And large crowds gathered outside, the Supreme Court of New South Wales on Macquarie Street, hoping to witness what one newspaper described at the time as one of the biggest legal smash hits since Nick Kelly. The atmosphere was described at the time as like that of an opening night of the ballet before the war, and as a court orderly later observed, there was never more interest shown in the murder trial. Mary Edwards would arrive at the court uh, and pose briefly for a press photograph outside, and DeBell wrote shortly after the bank by his lawyer and art and over the following days, many notable figures would attend, including Princess Emma of Erbach Schoenberg, who was the cousin of Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands and who was in Sydney at the time. The war reporter and poet, Kenneth Slesser, reported on the case of the sun, while a number of American servicemen were among the spectators, along with American diplomats. And Dora Tooby, um, that's a painting this exhibition around here too, lovely painting actually. Dora Tooby did caricatures of the various figures to sit in from the press box in the courtroom, and they were published in the papers um, over the following days. The lead lawyer appearing for Edwards and Walensky was none other than Guy Farley, and the case for Bacon and the household name across the country. The caring for the trustees was Frank Kitto, um, and both he and Barwick, of course, continue on to exceptional distinction in careers. Barwick was Commonwealth Attorney General, Minister for External Affairs, um, and Chief Justice, of course, 
um, of the High Court. And Hitto continued on, on to be a major figure in the, um, in the High Court um, as well. And in fact, there's a portrait also here in the collection of Hitto painted by Kevin O'Connor that won the Archibald in 1975, so people have got that too. Mm -hmm. Scenes inside the normal estate equity court throughout the trial were close to chaotic. One newspaper reported inside the court presented a hectic scene. There were lawyers in wigs and gowns, artists with and without beards, art students of both sexes, women with short hair and marvelous hats, and men with long hair and no hats. <laughs> newspaper reporters, court officials, shorthand writers, and numerous other people who evidently were there just for days of entertainment. Another quote from the time, the air was thick with Chanel III, my scent in Chaparelli shocking as wealthy matrons from the more select suburbs took seats in the spectators, um, in the spectators gallery. Um, these are some of the observations that were being made um, at the time um, and the whole sense of it um, is, uh, is, is sort of a yeah, little less than almost like the type of circus. De Bell later remembered him as mine by the spectators. And suggested that it would have made a wonderful film with the solo musical. <laughs> now, when proceedings got underway before Justice David Groper, who coincidentally, on my mother's side a year before, had decided her parents' divorce case, we were always, our family was always going to come up against Justice Groper. Um, Barwick's key argument was that when the trustees of the Art Gallery and Innocent Files made the decision to pay William the Bell prize money, they were guilty of breach of the trust. De Bell's painting was not an attempt to create a likeness of Joshua. Joshua Smith, it was ultimately the purpose to depict him in a distorted and caricature form. The purpose of the lawsuit was to gain an injunction preventing the trustees from paying the proceeds of the prize money to the bill and for a re-education of the prize. And after Barwick's opening statement, the painting of Smith, known as Exhibit D, was brought to the front of the courtroom and placed on an easel, where in Kenneth Slessor's wonderful words, it shone like a tropical butterfly in a museum. Over the following three days, a total of eight expert witnesses, including William De Bell, were called to give evidence in the trial, but I'm only going to cover the testimony of two of them quite briefly. One, James MacDonald, the complainants, and the other, De Bell, the defense of himself and the trustee. The book deals with the court case over four chapters. It's part of the book I enjoy, probably enjoy the most, because the court case, the court drama. Um, and if a film is made of it, and people have been talking about this, I reckon it will be the court case that, that gets, gets the nod. Now, the first witness called by Barnett was McDonald, the most vociferous public critic of the Bell and the portrait since the first weeks of the controversy. And he gave testimony memory, memorable for its severity and sweeping statements about the state of art and the contempt for the Bell style of painting. McDonald was asked by Barnett to compare the portrait with Joshua Smith, who was called and seated next to the portrait. Can you imagine that? The embarrassment almost too much to bear, especially when his individual features were being scrutinised into tactlessly on many occasions over the next three days, and he'd had this all year in Article 4. In MacDonald's opinion, the painting was not a portrait of Smith, and was instead, I quote, a pictorial defamation of character. Laughter and cries of dismay broke out in a packed courtroom, while the court cries sought vainly to bring it to order. Further to this, MacDonald claimed the portrait was bad man, cruel, distorted and degrading. A portrait allows for your consideration, your scrutiny, you do not feel as if it were your bounden duty to ring up the ambulance as you do when you see that sort of thing. It does not look like a normal person to me. It looks like an elf person, a person sick in body and brain. This is in the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Now, during cross examination, um, McDonald's robust tenacity combined with his breathtaking generalisations about the state of art he saw as he saw it continued to draw that laughter and gas feeling that they could draw into the gallery. And at the conclusion of the first day of the trial, the newspapers had their headlines in McDonald had provided so many. Um, the Sydney Sun cried, stricken creature, an American art dreadful. This was another thing that, that, um, that McDonald thought. Um, and in DeBell's hometown, Newcastle, um, the uh, people woke the next day to headlines. DeBell, DeBell picture is called Cruel and Degrading. Um, and these were the types of headlines that were in papers, right? Be they the major metropolitan dailies, or the little locals, um, uh, and little locals and regional papers all over the country. Days two and three saw um, 
uh, more plaintiff and defense, defense witnesses. For Debell's testimony, which was um, in day three of the trial, um, and it had enormous, enormous interest, and there were huge lines outside um, the court in the morning, people trying to get in to have a look at this incredible spectacle. And when Debell entered the witness box on the afternoon of day three, he initially spoke so quietly that it was almost inaudible, but he found his voice as the afternoon unfolded. And when asked about his approach to painting the portrait of Smith, Debell emphasised that he had sought to portray elements of Smith's character that he came to appreciate during the time he developed a friendship with him. Debell emphasised the draftsmanship he sought to execute in painting as well. And he'd come to see a certain determination and even stubbornness in Smith, and sought to portray these elements of his character, his character in the painting. And he said, Joshua has a habit when he's very determined and returned again to the point of sitting very erect and saying, I will go to Kirk, the Prime Minister, if necessary, to get his point. He's a very determined person, and I admire him for it, and I tried to show that. Now, the trial turned perhaps to its most anticipated point when Barwick began his cross examination of Debell. And Debell initially flinched when Barwick referred in his officious way to the painting as Exhibit D, but as the cross examination wore on, Debell came to display a quiet determination despite the immense strain. And he eventually responded with indignation to some of Barwick's increasingly insulting questions. Now, Barwick at one stage tried to break down each of the features of the portrait and asked the bill if each one of them was a faithful representation of Smith as a saw him. This was Barwick's and Criteria's approach to it. This went on for some time. DeBell had claimed that he too had got, he'd gotten a faithful representation of, of Smith. So Barwick said, all right, well, let's break this down. Let's look at the ears, look at the nose, look at the neck, etc." And finally, growing tired of the approach, DeBell responded to a question about the neck of Joshua Smith's neck in what would become one of the best remembered statements of the case. And I would love to offer the Bell's That old New Zealand gave the whole thing, you were taking it bit by bit and I'm taking it as a picture. I might as well criticise the conduct of your case by the angle of your wig as for you to take individual things like that. <laughs> a court broke into immediate uproar, and one society woman had to be restrained from enthusiastic clapping at the cleverness of the Bell's response. Imagine being a court crier during this trial. That was the end of the case. Um, um, something up happened the next day. And then Justice Rapper was the decision. And two weeks later, he handed his decision down. Um, and the decision was quite a sensible one in the end. Um, what Justice Roper said was that if the trustees had entered this portrait um, into the competition, they essentially defined it as a portrait in doing that. And by then deciding that it had won the prize, it was a portrait. And that you couldn't actually define portrait. There wasn't an art, a technical artistic definition of a portrait. It was really as a layman would, would define a portrait. Um, so this trying to make an argument that it wasn't a portrait just didn't wash. Um, and in the end, um, the uh, Edwards and Wilkinson lost. Uh, costs were awarded against them. Um, and Justice Roper offered, actually offered a definition of portraiture um, in, the, um, in the judgment as well. Um, there was an attempt, of course, to mount an unsecured to mount a high court appeal, um, and Mary Gilmore was central to this, and I cover this in quite a lot of detail in the book. Mary Gilmore's role in this is fascinating, and her attitude very much changes through 1944. Um, so if you want to know more about her and her involvement and her connections to Smith and her connections to the the book covers a lot of that. And it's another one of the most interesting parts of the book that I've found the research. Um, now, I'd like to finish with a brief consideration of some of the discoveries that I made about what was transpiring behind the scenes. And there's again a lot of coverage of this in the book. And with regards to Bell and Smith, it was known at the time that the two had become close friends in the years prior to the controversy. Smith was an admirer of Bell's ability, and the two became known to each other when they worked as camouflage laborers in the Civil Construction Court in 1942-43. They became close friends there. There's even a suggestion they became Mormon friends. They were both known to have been gay, but in 1940s Australia, this was unfortunately very much a taboo topic. And some of the bitterness that developed between Bell and Smith as 1944 in the years following it unfolded may well have been linked to their personal relationship. The other figure, um, also, I but these, these were caricatures that appeared in the weekend editions of the papers to start the trial. Um, 
one part of the pigeon, um, which is this one here, um, or a section of, of that one there. These were wild and at the time. Apparently, the, the, the pigeon one was reproduced in cardboard and sold. Um, there were lots and lots of copies of this floating around. Um, and this is a sort of portrait here that the women develops on the right that he did in the 1930s. Um, and the portrait on the left is one that came up just as the book was about to be published. My publisher um, had been having lunch with some friends up at the Blue Mountains. In fact, he just commissioned a portrait of some paintings from this person. And Matthew rang me on Monday morning, excited me, and said, we found another Dobell. Um, and the people he'd been to see had um, a sketch, sketch copy on the right in their collection, which had been given to them by Joshua Smith. And Smith claimed it was a, a study um, or, or portrait itself um, that was done as part of the Bell's painting, the original portrait. They very graciously gave us the gave us permission to publish this in the, the front of the book. Um, and it was just only weeks from going to press, so we managed to get it in. Um, Daniel Gilmore um, is, as I mentioned before, another fascinating figure in this. Joshua Smith was perhaps more competitive than his quiet and reserved demeanour might have led on. And with his own portrait of the still iconic Daniel Gilmore considered the unofficial runner up to Debell's portrait of him, the loss of the prize to Debell stung him quite sorely. And this became more apparent as the years unfolded, and it was probably also that was driving some of his opposition to the portrait as not enough week unfolded. And it was in the diaries of Daniel Gilmore that bore this out, uh, this fact out quite strongly. And her own role in the controversy was a little short of intriguing. Now, her resource, her uh, diaries are an incredible resource. There are around 650 typed pages per year in the 1940s. I don't know how she was going to be doing that, she's doing a lot of things. Writing poetry, publishing books, going in meetings, giving papers, and writing diaries. And she put everything into the diaries. So if somebody visited, she'd give an account of the person visiting. Um, if somebody wrote her a letter, she'd copy the letter into the diary. If she replied to the letter, she'd copy that reply into the diary. Um, if she did the shopping, she'd write down her shopping. Um, she had um, a connection with one of Winston Churchill's, I think a distant cousin of Churchill's, was in Australia during the war. And he used to visit Dame Mary quite regularly. And like Churchill himself, he was always running short of money. And so Dame Mary was always giving him you know, a pound or two to sort of keep him going. And my favourite diary entry, or the start of diary entry, which had nothing to do with this, as I'm flicking through the Dame National Library, was her entry from one of the days in 1944, and it was burnt two saucepans and lent Winston Churchill's cousin a pound. And that's how she started that day. That was the most fascinating resource. Now, Joshua Smith was an almost daily visitor to Dame Mary at her cramped flat in King's Cross. And as 1944 unfolded, they discussed the controversy on a regular basis. Her diary entries recorded some of their conversations, and they revealed an extraordinary about the face um, on her part as 1944 unfolded. And perhaps the most extraordinary discovery was Mary Gilmore's communications with Garfield Barwick and James McDonald during the trial. And original letters of Dame Mary's written to Barwick, advising him on potential lines of questioning, survive in the files of James McDonald held at the National Library. Now, at one point, she made one of the letters as directly observable in the line of questioning that Barwick pursued in the trial. And all of this would appear starkly incongruous with her typically left wing social and political ideas. And I go into more detail in the book as well. The other figure, of course, is Mary Edwards. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm a relative of Mary's, but I had no interest in rehabilitating her or defending her. I wanted to tell her story in more detail because it's not been told in any way the level of detail that was eventually available based on the research that I did. But I didn't want to set out to defend her. There are a group who would like to do that, and that's up to them, but that's not, um, I'm not particularly proud of being to someone who caused so much damage and division at this time, particularly to people like Ruben Develop. But Mary Edwards is mostly remembered for her role in the legal case, and over the years there have been some truly awful things said about her. And just recently Scott Bevan described her as squinting sceptically at the world and possessing the sort of expression that Develop could have mercilessly portrayed, just as he had with Mrs. South Kensington, and that's a portrait of Mrs. South Kensington, one of Develop's most famous from the 30s. None could be worse, however, than the observations of Donald Friend. And in one diary entry, Friend referred to her as an extremely mean woman, a poisonous old virgin, 
before concluding, it seems likely that this chair has assumed the proportions of an obsession on an old, warped, bitter old maid mind, and she'll pursue it until either she wins the case or it destroys her. Friends dislike Amelia went back to the 1930s, when in another diary entry he claims to have murdered her cat with a freaky dagger in the, in, at midnight in the moon. Um, I hate to get the types of text messages going for a lot of encoding. But Mary was a much more multi-dimensional figure than this, and that's what I try to, to bring out in the book. Um, one of the most revealing observations made about Mary, um, which demonstrated her strength of character and the complexity of her nature, was made by Pixie Harris, who was the illustrator of children's books from the time. And in a letter to an acquaintance in 1970, Harris explained that Mary Edwards was an extraordinary person, and once was the means of saving my life. She was a Christian scientist and a great power for good and bad. The bad part was when she packed poor De uh, Bill de Bell in a court case against his up to war prize winner. Mary has always had a struggle and is an absorbing personality. And a few years after this, the, the famous Australian project of Bayman came a long poem about Pixie and Harris, the life of Pixie and Harris. And part of the poem explained the dramatic circumstances by which Mary would save her life. And I'll read part of that stanza. In hospital, sick with rheumatic fever, gradually dying, swallowing mouthfuls of blood, the nurses gave me just days to live. And then a tigress, Mary Edwards, thrust aside the hospital staff like toys and burst an unex unexpected wind upon your deathbed, a blonde burning goddess from Valhalla. You can't pull down a blind out of the sun, the words she spat at you, released a spring of healing fluids that crept back through your body. I never wish to see her when I'm well, you say. What use the tigers in Amazing um, account there. As Pixie Harris related to Jeffrey Lane, I'll turn into that section of the poem. Now, um, I'd like to finish then. There's my book, there are copies of it available for sale afterwards, and I'm happy to sign them. The gallery have got them for sale, uh, for sale here at the front. Um, but I'd like to finish with the fate of the portrait because it met its fate at Carrick Hill in South Australia. It had been purchased by the owner of Carrick Hill, Sir Edward Haywood, who was a very prominent businessman in, in South Australia. He purchased it quietly from Debell in 1949. And in 1957, there was a big fire at Carrick Hill and it virtually destroyed the portrait. I gave a, a presentation at Carrick Hill uh, in August last year in the very spot where the, the fire happened and where the portrait would have been hanging behind me. It was all but destroyed and Debell had nothing to do with any attempt at destroying it. It was even reported by James Gleeson, who was Bell's friend and fellow artist, that De Bell felt, felt a sense of relief at the destruction of the portrait, given all the ill will he believed it had fostered. And it wasn't until after his death in 1970 that the charred remains of the portrait were sent to London for an attempt at a restoration, but the efforts to do so typically haven't been very well received. The whole story certainly has an element of tragedy attached to it. Among other things, there were bitter arguments, broken friendships, a costly legal battle, and the portrait was consumed by flames. But the story continues to draw extraordinary interest, and it would not seem that this interest in ongoing discussion and debate about the portrait will diminish any time soon. Thank you.
Um, so yeah, Tavella had a lot of support too. Yeah, and very prominent support. Did anyone think at the time that all of this harassment of Tavella was because he was gay? Yeah, so this has been one of the things that probably not so much harassment developed because he was gay, so much as there were there were private discussions that this representation of Joshua Smith in some way showed Smith's sexuality or elements or a hint of Smith's sexuality, and that that just shouldn't happen. It was, it was, it was dangerous, it was wrong, it was all those things that people thought about homosexuality. So I think it's connected to some of the criticism of Debell. I don't know if it's connected to Debell's sexuality itself. So it may well be an issue. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's fine. Thank you. Good question. Anybody else? I do have a question for you. Um, sure, well, do you. Have you written other books about art history at all, or is this sort of... No, um, I did an interview with ABC Melbourne on Thursday night about my, the book I published about the same time on Between Rome and Persia, uh, actually Rome and Persia at War. So my normal focus is ancient Rome and ancient Iran. Um, but um, because the family connection initially got me into this, and yeah. I was totally intrigued in it, and the archival stuff was amazing. And I think the ancient history side of it, the archaeology, the coins, the inscriptions, you, you go through, you try and find everything you can. Um, that's what drew me to the research on this, because there was just so much to, to tease out and track down and find. And the, the staff down there were literal, I think, I, you know, they still didn't shut up in there for 10 minutes when I made a discovery of Dom. But I had so many wonderful new work on this. One, found Lindsay's advice to Kitto. Which I've never seen. Lionel Lindsay is advising the defence in this case, and, and, and Kitter followed it. You know, it's, it's a real double mark for the stuff that So, is most of your research for this book done at different libraries with mm -hmm. the archives that you found? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a lot of archival stuff, and Trove was amazing. So, the yeah. newspapers, Trove just, I couldn't have done this without Trove. So, I'm Trove, make sure you're Trove. <laughs> <laughs> 